It's not yours? Okay. Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the subject is really controversial. And whoever chose the subject had the, have an idea in mind to get me in trouble. Because I asked one of the people here, I said, you're married, what are you doing here? He said, well, the title is, is there an alternative to marriage? <laughs> you know? And I happen to know that this person is happily married, so it's revealing, right? But let's start, let's start with general education. Let's educate ourselves from a different perspective about marriage. I'm going to ask you guys questions. What is marriage in Judaism? I will do my best, Bilal. It's your fault you didn't have a good speaking system here, OK? All right? What is marriage in Judaism? Put your hand up. Remember, I'll remind you. If, pe if nobody puts their hand up, I'll just pick anybody and ask them to tell me. And sisters, don't think that I exclude. I actually ask sisters more than I ask brothers. So I'm going to give you one more chance. What is, what is marriage in Judaism? How do they look at marriage? Uh, you mean very loose in what sense? Uh, like Christian uh, used to be like eternal, not pressure, and for the Bible and that. For Judaism, I came across the concept of like pressure. They, they were saying that they are very, they have a lot of alternatives. Okay. okay. Uh, Reform Jews. Reform, Ju Reform Judaism. That's the thing. You know, when we talk about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we know we're not uh, talking about monolithic groups. But generally speaking, the teachings of Judaism is that marriage, when a woman is married to a Jewish family, she's not married to the man, she's married to the family. Therefore, in Jewish... Well, I'm going to be walking back and forth if this is a workshop, okay? So I'm going to do my best. So the teachings of Judaism, the jurisprudence of Judaism, teaches that when a woman is married into a family, she actually belongs to the family. So much so that if uh, the woman doesn't have, they have a lot of rules, but if the woman doesn't have any children, then she's obligated, she automatically becomes the wife of the, the brother, the second brother in line, whether he's married or not. Now, they've modified it now, you know, especially with Reform Judaism, where they really don't have the same structure of marriage that we even know conventionally. Okay, and some of you who are familiar with the Bible would remember the story when uh, you know the Pharisees who are Jews they come to Jesus and they say, you know, when a person dies, this woman who is married to a man according to Jewish law, and her husband died, she married, then the second man married her automatically, and she, until she married seven of them, and they all died. So they asked Jesus, who does she belong to in heaven? Who does she go with? Of course, Muslims have a different question. This is a serial mur murderer. She killed seven guys. You know, nobody investigated that, <laughs> right? Okay, so that's, that's Jewish law initially. Now, how about in Christianity, in general? I know they have a lot of different sects. What does Christianity teach about marriage? Well, uh, rephrase that. You're right, that Brother Said. Uh, Why? That's exactly right. It's, uh, it's uh, a, a divine or holy matrimony. It's, it's not a contract. It's a union. That's a fundamental difference, is that it's a union. A man and a woman get married. Now, is that, is that the real teaching of Christianity? Not according to Muslims. Christianity didn't teach this. It's Paul. St. Paul is the one who decided that a marriage between a man and a woman is a holy matrimony and can never be broken because of the union of God and Mary. That's the thinking that he has in mind. Of course, that caused a lot of problems for Christianity. We see a lot of divorce. And for most, and we're talking, when we're talking about Christianity, we talk about in the general sense. Because again, there are diff many different sects who have different takes on this. But in general, this is how it's looked at, marriage. Now, how about in Islam? What is it? OK, is it a holy contract? Sacred union. That's a good way of putting it. So it's a union between a man and a woman, but it is a contract. It is actually called, in all Islamic legal books, it's called aqd and nikah. It's a marriage contract. A marriage contract between a man 
and a woman. And there are two kinds of marriage contracts in Islam when it comes to the choice of relationship. And we're not talking about mutayat, okay? We'll talk about mutayat, right? I know a lot of you are interested in that subject. So two kinds of relationships. One that is based on, you want to just carry this around? You must stand here. Yeah, yeah, stand so this is not a workshop, guys. I'm sorry. All right, okay. <laughs> you? All right, no problem. We'll modify it. Technical issue. Technical yes, no, no problem. No problem. No problem. So uh, there are two kinds of marriages. Let's talk about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. We know that he had multiple wives. Right? How old was he when he got married first? Okay, everybody knows that, 25, right? Yeah. Right? 25. Now, when did he take his second wife? How old was he? Yeah. Put your hand up so we know, mashallah, okay? What is it? 50, right? Okay, so for 25 years he had one wife. Who was it? Khadija. Khadija. And specifically when it comes to Khadija, and this is some of the sisters <laughs> talked about this yesterday, how did he, how did he and Khadija get married? She asked him, right? Was it recommended by God or pointed out by God? No, it wasn't. Okay? It wasn't pointed out by God, but when they get married, this is in a different realm. Maryam السلام, was present, Asiya was present, other women were present at the wedding. Right? So this was a, a marriage that was endorsed by God, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, when the Prophet was married to Khadija, he never took on a second wife or another wife. The daughter of Ramadan. This is a different realm. We get into metaphysics now. Let's just keep that aside, okay? Because we're talking about legal issues today only, all right? So, so the Prophet ﷺ didn't take on a second wife. Actually, he, he took a first wife after Khadija died, right? Well, he was married to Khadija. He never married another woman. Does this remind you of another relationship that we know in Islam that's holy to us? Imam Ali and Fatima al-Zahra didn't even occur to them to take on a second wife. What does this tell us? The, this, well, th that's true. There are no equals to Khadija and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, but what does this mean to us in our lives? That's one way of looking at it, that although you are you can marry more than one. We'll talk about polygamy. I know it's a hot subject and you wanted us to cover it too. But, um, but that's not the real reason. The real lesson, in my opinion, that we get out of this is that if there is harmony, if there is peace at home, do not disturb that peace. If there is a good relationship between man and woman, nobody has, nobody has the right to disturb that peace. And that's one kind of marriage. That marriage that's built on Mutual respect and mutual love. Clearly, it was manifested in the first marriages of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Imam Ali alayhi salam of, Fatima, of Khadija and Fatima al Zahra. Clearly, there is no question about it because they were long-term marriages. There were no other marriages, and as soon as Khadija died, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam started taking on other wives. Not all the wives were good women. He was a prophet, it's true, but that doesn't mean that his wife has to be a great woman, right? So if we go and study each one of the women that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa married, we find, we find them to be quite different than each other. Take, for instance, Umm Salama. How many of you know about Umm Salama? Okay? How would you describe Umm Salama, sister? Okay. I'm going to give you... I'm going to tell the sister. I'm going to say something that's going to get the sisters really, really mad. And before they throw anything at me, I'm going to fix it. Okay? <laughs> All right. So we have a hadith. We have a hadith that says, "Consult women for men. Consult women and do the opposite of what they say." Because they change their minds so fast. The sister is very angry, by the way. <laughs> I mean, the way she said it is very. She's very angry. She said because they change their minds so fast. Okay. That hadith is true. And this is, let me give you the circumstances of the hadith. Aisha said, 
Aisha said, she said, the Prophet used to come to me on Hafsa and ask us questions. And whatever we told him, he did the opposite. That's true. Allah knows this is a Sunni hadith and it's very true. <coughs> but we know in Hudaybiyah, Salah al Hudaybiyah, the companions of the Prophet refused to listen to him because they didn't want to have peace with the Meccans. They wanted to go do the pilgrimage. And the Prophet said, let's turn back. And some of the elements in the agreement they didn't like. The Prophet وسلم, went to Ummu Salama and consulted her and did exactly what she did. So let's pay attention to this. What Aisha was, say, was generalizing, she was saying that the Prophet, therefore, this, our Sunni brothers say, consult women and do the, other, the opposite. We say to them, no, that was very specific to their Aisha and their Hafsa. Because they were troublemakers. It's the truth. It's the absolute truth. But when it comes to Ummu Salama, when it comes to Khadija before Ummu Salama, when it comes to some other women of the Prophet's wives, he did exactly. He consulted them and he actually went along with their advice. So let's be careful when we hear these things, we understand the circumstances behind them. Including, by the way, which is a side issue, when Imam Ali alayhi salam talks about the woman who was all evil. He's talking about that very specific woman who led an army against him. So now we know that the other, another kind of marriage, as did the Prophet and did Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. They both did other kinds of marriages, which are marriages of shared interest. And I would really want us to all pay attention to this because in our, especially Eastern cultures, we don't get this concept. And certainly in our Western culture, we don't get this concept. Because to us, either marriage is a holy matrimony, according to you know, the Christian culture that we live in, predominantly Christian culture, or that, or that it is a union, a permanent union between a man and a woman. And we said that in Islam there is, if there is harmony between man and woman, there is no reason for them to take on another wife. And some of our marriages, in fact, it seems to be a popular opinion within our uh, scholarly circles, is that a man cannot take on a second wife without the permission of his, his first wife. Right? How many sisters are married here? Put your hand up. How many of you would give hus your husband permission to marry another wife? <laughs> oh, there she says, yeah, the sister says, okay. I want to get rid of him, right, sister? Actually, my grandmother convinced my grandfather to take on another wife. She did, and she found him a wife, and she absolutely persuaded him to take on the second wife. So it happens. And I can understand. Can you see circumstances where it would happen? Can you? It, it could happen, right? But it's never, it's never going to happen with you, right? Somebody else. That's how, that's how we are. So at least conceptually we understand. The marriage of shared interest is another type of marriage that we condemn while we should condone. The Prophet ﷺ married other women. Umm Salama who came to him and said, you know, I'm a widow. Will you marry me? And said, she said, I don't have anybody to take care of. Will you marry me? He said, yes. It's a marriage, of, a marriage of shared interest. Did they have a love, the love between a man and a woman at that time? No, he was her prophet. She loved him as her prophet, but they get married. Now, can we apply that to our communities? Look, brothers and sisters, around the world, not just in, in the American Muslim community, around the world we're facing a problem. And this problem is called unusa in Arabic, where we have a lot of brothers, and more so, we have a lot of sisters who are not married. What are the factors behind that? War. What is it? War. What does war have to do with being, not being married? Men. We, we, there are more women than men. Yeah. But I don't think that war actually is the main cause. Money. Money. We made it so expensive to get married. It, we made it so expensive. I want to tell you a story. This is a true story. A brother in Jordan wanted to find a good woman to marry. So somebody told him, you know, there is a sister there. They get, he got to know the sister. And then he went to ask for her hand, the proper way. Her brother said, OK, 25,000 Jordanian dinars, $40,000. So the brother said, look, I don't have $40,000. You know, I'll give you $10,000. But you know, besides, she is the one who should define the wedding, uh, the, the dowry, not you. Well, this man, her brother, said, look, I'm going to put it to you. In the simplest terms, I have six, six sisters. I want 25,000 dinars for each head. They were cattle to him. 
And it's a Muslim society, supposedly, regardless of the fact that it's a Sunni society, but that it's a Muslim society. I know Sunni Islam doesn't endorse this, his behavior either. But our cultures have come to endorse this kind of behavior. They're behind. We're Americans. We're ahead of them, right? Right? Then no, absolutely not. Here in our culture, in the American Muslim culture, we're acting in a way similarly. I've, I've, I've had so many families that come to me and say, my son, my daughter, and they're believing, I mean, they are great believers, beautiful people. You know, you know, they're marriage age, and you know, if you know somebody, we can introduce them, that would be great. Okay, well, do you have any requirements? Iranian brothers, well, I, you know, I don't mind Arabs, you know, but Iranians are better. Okay, it's true. Arabs, I wish, it's, I wish they would even open up the umbrella to all Arabs. I prefer, you know, Iraqis, you know, if they're from Nasiriyah, I'm from Nasiriyah, that's even better. <laughs> Isn't this true? That's true. Uh, Lebanese, Lebanese are a little more open-minded. A little more open-minded. So they can accept anybody from South Lebanon, from, the, from South It doesn't have to be a specific <laughs> village, right? Right? Isn't that how it is? Allah knows this story is a true story, what I'm going to tell you. My accountant is a Pakistani great brother. I, I love him. He's a friend of mine. He's a Pakistani Sunni brother. Some of you know him. One day he called me up and he said, you know, we know each other first name basis. I've known him for tens of years. He says, you know, I have a strange situation. I need your help with it. I said, what is it? He said, I took care of this child, this boy, since he was a baby. He's a Shia. And he's a Sayyid. And he's a doctor. And we went and asked for this girl's hand that he fell in love with in somewhere in another state. And they're saying that he's not good enough. And they're Shias. And they say it. I said, what, what exactly are they saying? What don't they like about him? They said, and I'll explain this to you for some of you who won't understand this. They said he is Rizwi and they're Naqwi. They are from the 8th, uh, 10th ten, Imam. Iraqis, help me out. Okay? <laughs> right? The 8th Imam. Salam And he comes from the 8th comes from the eighth Imam and they come from the 10th Imam. They're pure blood. Allah Akbar. I mean, this, this brother, this brother has all the good traits for, I didn't see him, but I asked this guy, I said, well, maybe he's ugly. <laughs> he said, no, he's a good looking guy. I have his picture if you want to see it. But they said that, no, no, you know, he is Rizwi, we wouldn't accept this. I've heard the story repeated over and over and over. Where does it say that in Islam? And now we have, I have brothers who come to me I would like to get married, please, uh, you know, either sheikh or whatever they call me, right? I'd like to get married, can you help me out? What are your requirements? Well, you know, she has to be highly educated, she, li she, li she, li she has to, have to like cars, BMWs specifically, <laughs> you know? She has to really know how to cook and she has to respect me as the head of the family and she has to love my parents and... I, actually, most of those people, I say, okay, sure, and I cross them off. Because nothing will please them. Is this what Islam wants us to do? Seriously. And some of them say, well, I have to really love her first. Uh, seriously. To, how, how the heck are you going to love her first if you're going to be a Muslim? You get to know her. Islam allows you all the means to do that. But how do you love a person before you know them? How do you love a person before you meet them, even? They say this because what is in their heads is in what's in oh, many of our heads about marriage, which is when I get married, I want the person who, to live with me, to think exactly like me, to act exactly like me, to like what I like, to understand every opinion I have, to respect every opinion I have, and by the way, they can be their own person if they want to. <laughs> it is true. This is really true. You know, my wife, Umm Muhammad, where are you? She's here somewhere. You know, she knows a lot of people call me. She's sitting back there. A lot of people call me. A lot of people come over. A lot of people come to ask me for counsel with their marriage, marital problems. And I swear to Allah, 90% of their problems are trivial. It's just that they're off, they just need alignment with the way they communicate and their expectations of each other. The biggest problem that I see is that a man and a woman, or a woman, both of them are guilty of this. They want the other person to match a picture that they drew of a husband or a wife. And guess what? There isn't anybody as perfect as that picture except what my wife found. LAUGHTER
<laughs> it's true, you know, well, you know, I had to have that, right? But the truth is, the truth is a lot of us have that image. Well, the reality is, it's that we're all flawed. We all have a lot, have a lot of flaws. Or, have you heard this before? Married people, have you heard this before? When I married this person, they were just the, more, the perfect person. I just fell in love with him, or I fell in love with him. They were perfect. My God, we used to hold hands, used to go to restaurants together. We used to spend the best time. What happened? They changed. They're human. Of course they changed. You changed too. Maybe it was you who changed. Of course this will happen. It is amazing how many marriages actually broke up because of this. Really, marriages of many believers, where they shouldn't break up, they just came to a point where they're not willing to understand each other. They're not willing to reconcile with each other. What they focus on, and this is where, I think since yesterday some of you have heard me speak in Arabic, you know I'm a fan of Western culture, more than Eastern cultures, right? But in this, Western culture is devastating. In this, Western culture has a great shortcoming, which is, it is built and centered around me. I am the most important. This person who, you know, many times I had children with, spent many years with, you know, whatever it is, right? I have a lot of experience with. They just don't understand. Ask yourself. Ask each other this problem. Listen to each other very carefully. When you hear about other people who approach you and say, you know, we're having marital problems, help us out. Just listen to them. The first two, three sentences, you'll know what the problem is. He can't understand me. She can't get me. She doesn't get me. Well, it's you're making, you're making yourself the center of the world for the marriage. You're not. What is more important is that you win a fight or you preserve the marriage. Which leads us to the second thing when it comes to marriages. I'm going all the way to divorce here, so be, bear with me, right? It leads us to the second, the second thing. How important is marriage to us? Why is it that we don't distinguish between, between a battle and a war? To us, if we disagree, any of us, married people, if we disagree many times about a meal, it's the end of the world. We don't want to talk, we want to yell at each other, let's talk divorce, where are the lawyers? It just leads to crazy things. So many times we don't understand that this disagreement is a disagreement. We can contain it, it's not that important. And many times we just don't know how to communicate. This is just amazingly devastating that we don't know how to communicate with each other and with the people that we love and we share our lives with. The purpose of marriage in Islam, can you define it for me, anybody? What is it? What's the purpose of marriage in Islam, according to the Quran? Continuity. Continuity. What else? What's in the Quran? What is it? Mawadda. You know what Mawadda is? I know Idris knows what Mawadda is because I tested him on that in college, right? Right? Mawadda is proactive love. Proactive love. Marriage is supposed to bring sakina. There is nothing in the Quran that says marriage, one of the requirements of marriage is hub. There is hub, there is a difference between hub and mawadda. How many of you guys here are Shia? Put your hand up. Unless you're a shim. You're, are you Shia brother? Come on now, you know, like this, put your hand up, okay? If you're Shia, put your hand up, okay? You love Ahl Bayt alayhi salam? Where does it say in the Quran that you have to love Ahl Bayt, hub of Ahl Bayt, where? But it doesn't say love. Does it say hub? Mawadda. It says mawadda. What is mawadda? The difference between hub and mawadda, and I want you to understand, because it, it affects our, us being Shias, how we deal with Ahl Bayt salam, but also it affects us, us dealing with our spouses. Hub is what the Egyptians sing about. <laughs> Seriously. It's an empty feeling. And Egyptians, I mean, they're amazing. You know, they see a cow walking down the street and, oh, ya hub. You know, and they start singing about it, you know, right? Okay. Right? That's how they are. But what Islam, Islam doesn't, Allah doesn't care about the word hub. In fact, the word hub occurs in, in the Quran twice. And in both those situations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls for action. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي If you love Allah, to hib, which is the feeling only, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Follow me. There is action. The feeling by itself is meaningless. Because love, you know, we love football teams, right? I don't love the Vikings anymore, they're losing all the time. But you know, so we love football, we love political situations. 
It's an empty feeling. But it's when you do something about it that it means something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The love of Ahlul Bayt, mawadda, Allah wants us to do. Not only feel it in the heart, do it in our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about marriage the same thing. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا That mawadda is proactive. It is truly loving the other person with actions. Not just to say, I love you. Although the Prophet ﷺ told us, he said, when a man says to a woman, I love you, she'll, she'll never forget it. It never leaves her heart. So the Prophet wants us to say this. But Arabs, of course, don't say that because they're too manly, right? I'm joking, Arabs are wonderful people. I'm one of them, right? So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be proactive in our love and respect of our spouses. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً and mercy, rahmah. Have you, you know what surprises me with a lot of uh, you know, um, marriage disputes and family problems is that how mean people get become to each other. People become really mean to each other, nasty to each other. You know, most of us are, all of us inshallah, are nice people. We go out in the street, even in the hotel lobby here, we see somebody we don't know, Muslim or non-Muslim, we say hello, smile at them. You know, they, they ask for directions, we give them directions. They say, you know, uh, do you know where I can get water? Oh yeah, absolutely, I'll walk you there, you know. But many of us, inshallah we don't, but some, many people, the kid comes to them and says, mom, dad, I'm thirsty. Well, get out of my way, you can, you can go get the water by yourself. Right, how many of us do that? How many of us, at, with our coworkers, walk into the office every day, how was your day? How did you sp spend the weekend, you know? And we're smiling to each other, we're nice. Well, you know, how did you do with that project? How many of us do, we do we, all of us do that, right? Uh, you know, at, at the university, how's that study coming? You know, how's that book coming, right? We're always smiling to each other. How many of us, a spouse or a child or a brother or a sister walk in at home and we say, how was your day? You know, instead of whatever we do, right? Whatever we do, I don't want to give examples. What is it? Yeah, what did you cook for me? Oh, okay, you, you want to start with the women, men. All right, okay, okay. This, the sister is an attorney here, so I have to go along with her. So, so yeah, what did you cook today? Why, you know I don't like that meal. Why, why did you do it that way, right? Or she starts by saying, make sure you put the other jacket in that specific hanger there. You know, okay, so I have to get back at the sister, right? You know, why don't, we, why don't we do with what Islam, what does Islam tell us about when we see each other? Greet each other with the most beautiful words. Peace be with you. Why don't we do that? Why don't we embrace? Why don't we, uh, you know, thank Allah for having this other person in our lives who cares about us more than we care about ourselves, take care of us. Well, maybe two years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't even know this person. How many really, how many of us grew up and knew the person that they married from childhood? How many of us? There are exceptions. How many of us? Okay, two, mashallah, two, three. Most of us don't. Most of us, at one point in the future, you know, in our future, in our lifetime, we, we meet a person, we're introduced to a person, we get to know a person, and they become our spouse. And they come to love us so much, give us everything that they have in their life, dedicated to us. We, don't, we didn't thank Allah for, for, for that. How many of us? How many of us make a sujood al shukr, thank you Allah for this spouse that I have? Seriously, how many of you guys done, done that? Brothers and sisters. See, one, two, he's my son, he's my student, he's my friend, and that, she's my sister, right? And the sister there I cannot see, all right? So my, go, to, go, to, go to your home, go to your hotel room, and make a sujood and say, Allah, thank you, really, I sincerely thank you for introducing me to this person who became such an important person in my life, where I share my life with that person. How many of us do that? But you know, the truth is, the truth is not all marriages work out. People, disputes occur, and many times, many divorces happen because of a small seed that happens in the relationship, an evil seed. Somebody had a dispute with somebody. Well, ridiculous, something really ridiculous. What did you cook me today? Okay, she made tabouli instead of baba ghanouj. Right? And he said, I don't like this. And he was complaining about something else at work, but he doesn't dare say that. Or he doesn't have, many of us don't have that, you know, power or insight to know that I'm upset about something else. So I take it out in tabuli. So I come home, and I say that to my wife, and my wife says, well, I'm sorry, okay, you know, next time. 
or okay, I'll put it away, I'll make whatever you want. But she keeps it in her heart. And this is one of the biggest dangers. We build, we keep nucleus, a nucleus of a, an explosion in our hearts. She keeps it in our heart, in her heart. One trait that I found that women have more than men is that they don't forget. Seriously. <laughs> my wife, I love the heck out of my wife. We have the best marriage. She reminds me about things 20 years ago. Remember 20 years ago when I did? I said, no, I don't remember. <laughs> All I remember are the good things, right? Right? So women do that. So she keeps it in her heart, okay? A long time from now, they have a dispute about another something that's very, very important in their life, the kind of pop that he brought home that day. Didn't I tell you to bring Pepsi? Why did you bring 7-Up? Remember three years ago when you asked me about this? You always hold it, you know, and it blows up into something bigger. You know, I'm making it funny, but it's not. I'm making it sound funny, but it's not. Wallah, brothers and sisters. From my experience, and I have been counseling people for a long time. From my experience, marriages break up because of a little stupid, little minute disagreement that people do not resolve right away. Well, in this case, they are not acting on their mawadda. They're not acting on their love. They're burying it. And they destroy the love that they have. In this case. And I want to remind all of you, married or not married, remember these words that I'm telling you right now. When somebody comes, especially somebody you love, by the way, this applies to coworkers, applies to teachers, students, everybody that we interact with. If they say something you don't like, ask them to clarify themselves. Try to understand beyond the words that they're saying. Because I guarantee you, that husband who walks in and he doesn't want a tabula that day, he's not complaining about tabula. He's complaining about another problem in his life. And yes, not every woman is a good psychologist. But try to understand where he's coming from. And the more important thing is, I want that man, if he was standing here today, to remember that every word that he says, he's responsible for it. Remember what the Quran says that every deed, and words are deeds, because words are actions that come out of our mouths, is a seed. It's either a blessed seed or an evil seed. And you're responsible for it. You could have destroyed a whole family because of this. You could have destroyed your own family, your own beloved people, because of something that you didn't think when you're driving home to let go of that problem and instead you decided to bring it home and levy it on top on the head of the woman who's standing there cooking for you. And same thing for sisters. Try to understand. Try to be good counsels for your husbands as well. You know, we all lose our temper. We all say wrong things. Try to control yourselves. Try to be forgiven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is an amazing ayah in the Quran. I always say to people, I will guarantee you right now, in front of Allah, a gate, a key to heaven right now, very simple to do. Try it right now, everybody with me. Think in your head. Don't, you don't have to tell me, but think in your head. Who is the person that you despise most? Hate. Okay? And I, now I want you to apply this verse to them. فَلْيَعْفُوا وَلِيَ I'll translate it. فَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Forgive and forget. Don't you love to have Allah forgive your sins? If you forgive and forget the shortcomings of your worst enemy and Allah will forgive you, what would happen if you forgive and forget the person that the mistakes and the shortcomings of the person you love? What would happen? Allah for sure will, have, will send you to heaven. This is a beautiful verse, but we don't practice it. In fact, we're willing to forgive and forget the mistakes of our coworkers, people that we run into the street, but when it comes to our spouses, they're the last people that we forgive and forget. So try very hard, work really hard in your marriage. It is the most solid foundations, as the Prophet said, the most important foundation that Allah has created after Islam is the foundation of marriage. Preserve that marriage. Fight for your marriage. Because if you don't fight for your marriage, if you don't have children, you can get divorced. Okay? And let me just give you a quick, brief education about divorce according to Shia Islam. 
We Shias are ex exactly the opposite of Sunnis when it comes to marriage and divorce. Shias do not require witnesses for people to get married. They recommend, it's recommended to have witnesses. Sunnis require witnesses for people to get married. Shias require witnesses for a divorce. Sunnis do not require witnesses for divorce. We require, we focus on building families and keeping families together. So when people decide that they're going to get divorced, don't go run to the court. Your divorce in the court by itself, it's a legal divorce, but it's non a non-Islamic divorce that has absolutely no meaning. There is a process you have to go through. You have to go to a member of your family. The spouse goes to a member of her or, her or his family. They try to get them together and say, we have a dispute. We don't seem to be able to resolve. Help us out. If you don't have anybody who's qualified or you don't feel comfortable with your family, go to somebody you know. Alhamdulillah, we have a highly professional community. Really highly professional community. People who are trained in dispute resolution. I think the sister is too, right? I, I, seriously, wallah, I'm, I'm going to give you a lot of work, sister. So pick up, take her number and say, sister, you know, look, you're trained in dispute resolution. You know, I, I'm having a problem I cannot resolve and I don't know who to talk to, who to talk to about. What do you think? And you'll find a person who is removed from your problem to be very objective. They'll give you very good advice. Islam requires this. Islam absolutely requires this. Then the next step, if you couldn't resolve the problem, is you go and ask for a divorce. And I'll tell you right now, every pious sheikh, inshallah they're all pious, or sayyid, will say, can you resolve this? They'll try to resolve it because it's their obligation. Everybody. So don't despair, because I hear from a lot of people, well, you know, we know that we can reconcile our differences. Why are you giving us a hard time? I've heard this, I heard other sheikhs complain, but you know, it's our obligation. Why don't they understand? It's their, it's their obligation. It is our obligation to tell you to try to reconcile your differences and to resolve your issues, if you can't. And now we come to divorce. You have to have two witnesses, then the divorce can be conducted. Now, let me step back. How many of you are not married here? Okay? Brothers, put your hands down. You're gonna hate me. Sisters, no, sisters can put their hands up. Sisters who are not married, pay attention to me, including the lawyer sisters, because what I'm gonna tell you right now is a legal issue. A marriage between a man and a woman is, and by the way, just for those of you who don't know, that's the only san sanctioned marriage in Islam. <laughs> Same-sex marriages are haram, okay? Just in case somebody doesn't know, <laughs> okay? In, in your marriage, sisters, listen to me. In your marriage contract with the boy who is going to marry you, listen to me, sisters. Some of you are not paying attention. You might regret not paying attention, okay? <laughs> you have the right to define the dowry, and it belongs to you, not to your parents. You have the right to define where to live. If you don't, by default, it goes to the man. You like this, the third one. You have the right to put a condition that your husband will not take on a second wife. Okay? He says, yes, his wife did that to him, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay? I don't know, sister, if you know this stuff or not. Yeah. You have the right to negotiate for what is called the initiative of divorce. We have khul in Islam, which is a woman can come to her husband and says, look, honey, I can't stand your face anymore. <laughs> okay, I don't like you anymore. What do you want? He says, well, I want that car, you know, that you have. Okay, you can take it, I'm done. You can take it, we're divorced. That, that's already in Islamic law, right? But a woman can negotiate the initiative for divorce to say, I want the right, if we don't get along, to get divorced, you, don't, you, you know, and you l relinquish that right. What do you mean by initiative? Initiative, that means he, she would be able to say, you're divorced, I'm done with you. Oh. Yeah, okay. By default, it goes to the man. So as are our laws in the United States, there are a lot of things in default, unless otherwise negotiated, marriage contracts are exactly the same thing. Now, and I'm sorry for the sisters who are sitting here. What? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So I'm, and I'm sorry again to the sisters who are already married and they say, I wish I knew this before, right? That's, that's what you get for not coming to the conference. So learn this, it's important, because, why? Because when you hold some of these elements in your hand, when you hold these elements in your hand, 
the marriage goes smoother, actually. Because sometimes we as humans, men or, or otherwise, when we have certain kinds of power, we tend to <coughs> swing them around. Show them. I have this right. You know? Let's move. Let's do this. Let's do that. But if the man knows that the woman made those conditions, it puts a lot of peace in the family, and the marriage survives. Educate yourself about this stuff. That is very important. Now, nothing worked. You're divorced. And now a man is a divorcee and a woman is a divorcee. Or a divorcer and a divorcee. Does that work? They're both divorcees, right? Yeah. Okay. They're both divorcees. So now what happens to them? I'm going to first tell you what happens to them in Islam. Then I'm going to tell you, you're going to tell me what happens to them in our communities. Or should we start, should we do it the other way? Why don't you tell me? What happens when a brother or a sister is divorced? Let's start with brothers. When a brother is divorced, what happens to them? Can they get married again? No. Okay. Well, some of them can, right? Not all. Some of them can. It's easier for brothers, right? The truth is, it's easier for brothers. But still, they have a stigma around them. They're a divorce, a divorcee. They were divorced before, so there must be something wrong with them, right? They also have hesitation about being married again, right? Especially if they have children, it becomes much more difficult, right? How about sisters? If a sister is divorced, what are her chances of being remarried? Why? Let's talk practical issues. Let's be honest with each other. Why would a sister who has been divorced have lesser chances of remarrying? What is it? That's one of them. A man doesn't want a woman who has already been married. Where do we get that? Our cultures, our cultures, right? Okay, yeah, culture. What's the second reason? Yes, it's, it's true. You know, look at the conference here. From my observation, there are twice as many sisters as our brothers. One conclusion is that sisters are more dedicated to their faith. You know, they're more serious about family, more serious about upbringing a good community. It's true. This is one of my observations. And the second thing is that we simply have more women than men in this world. It is. It's a fact. All you have to do if you want to see it, I don't care where you live, in what country you are, drive around, except in Saudi Arabia because only men drive, right? <laughs> right? Okay. And, you know, drive around and look around. There are more women than men. Look at your work. There are more women than men. Wherever you go, it's, it's just a reality that we live in. So there are more options. That's really true. There are more options. It's unfortunate. So now, what does Islam teach us about this? Does Islam endorse this kind of behavior? Does Islam sanction this kind of behavior? Now, the brothers, and I don't want you to put up your hands right now, but the brothers who are not married, or the brothers who are married, let's focus on the brothers who are not married right now. Do you think for a minute you have more reward with Allah if you marry a divorced sister or a sister who has never been married? You didn't have to answer me. A rhetorical question. I just want you to think about it for a minute. Think about it. For those brothers who are not married, another option, by the way, the sister said they have more options. Another option is that many of us are either immigrants or the children of immigrants, right? And we always say, you know, the, the, the parents who have accents like me, well, you can marry somebody from Jordan. Jordanian women are the best. They're not, actually. Honestly, I'm telling you the truth. They're not. Or uh, Iraqis. Iraqi women are the best. They're not. You know who's best? The best person is a person who grew up in the same community, in a household that's similar to yours, so that you become close to them. You want them to be Muslim so they can be close to you in Islam. It doesn't have to always be, but I prefer, I'll be honest with you, I prefer that your spouse should be a Muslim for the sisters, your husband be a Muslim, and for the brothers, uh, for the sisters it's a requirement that they be a Muslim. For the brothers, it's better that she's a Muslim. Because you're 80% there with their education, with their faith, with everything else. All you have to do is work in the 20% of the differences, personality differences between you and that person. But brothers and sisters, for those of you, the brothers especially, who are thinking about going back to Iraq or Lebanon and getting married, it's a beautiful thing. I'm not going to discourage you from that. But look at the sisters who grew up, who were born and grew up here. Look at the sisters 
who are your sisters, but they didn't happen to be born of your parents. They understand you. They'll understand everything that you say. They'll understand your faith. They'll understand the way you conduct yourself. They'll understand when you say, let's go watch a football game. Because they don't even know what football is. They'll understand when they say, let's go to Red Lobster and have some seafood. All of this will make a big difference in your life. I can guarantee, and from my observation, this is my observation, and I know some of the brothers and sisters will disagree with me. I can guarantee you, if you marry a, a, a young lady from the same community who is a believing, who grew up in a good family, that you'll have a more peaceful life. Then you bring somebody from another culture who you have the risk of a culture clash, which will always happen. They'll start missing their family, missing their culture, and it will be a different experience for you. So I highly, highly recommend for all the brothers uh, and the sisters uh, to marry first, first to marry people from our own communities. I really do. And I know I'll get some different opinions, and that's fine. I respect everybody's opinion. But from my observation, those are the marriages that will survive most, and that will flourish, and they'll have a lot of happiness. That's one thing. The second thing is, if you're an Iranian, don't be, right? <laughs> if you're an Iranian, you know, ask Brother Said. I love Brother Said. By the way, Allah knows his voice, the best voice for Dua Kumail, for Quran, MashaAllah. If anybody doesn't know Brother Said, go and ask him for a free CD. Uh, he has absolutely the most beautiful voice. But look what Iranians, what happens with Iranians. A serious, a serious issue with the Iranian culture. I'm really serious about this. Iranians, of course, after high school, they have to get license, bachelor's degree, then focal license, master's degree, then do doctor degree. Some of them get post-doctor's degree, and then they have look for a wife who is the same thing. You know, I, forgive me, all of us are adults. You lost your youth. You lost the most beautiful years of your life. And now you decide you're going to get a spouse. And many times, by the way, highly educated, like Brother Sayyidan, he's very highly educated, professor of biology. biology. The hardest subject for me. OK? So, you know, they, they are very smart people. At the end of the day, what do they do? Their parents, or they pick up the phone, call Iran, and say, find me a wife. I, I see a lot of wrong things with this. I see a lot of my friends, my workers, my students who are Iranians, and I really think that they miss on the best years of their lives. It is completely an, an Islamic teaching. Islamic teaching says specifically, as soon as you mature, mature rushd, not faqat bulugh, you know, not only um, uh, sexual maturity, but rushd, that means you're aware, which I put about 18. If your son or daughter, actually daughter is even younger, Say, I'm really, I'm make them comfortable to come and tell you, Mom, Dad, I'm ready to get married. I'm ready to get married. Don't discourage them. Say, absolutely. Absolutely. Just give them the guidelines for what you think a good spouse is. <coughs> and if you happen to know somebody, say, you know, I I'll introduce you to this person. Or if they know somebody through the community who's Maybe they know they grew up to, you know, with each other, they saw each other at the center or college or something. Say, well, I think this person is good. Don't discourage them. If, they are, if you're Lebanese and they say, hey, you know, I, I saw this uh, you know, a Lebanese girl. She says, I, you know, I saw this Iraqi you know, brother who was at college and we, we talked respectfully. They're believers. I think he would be a good husband. Don't say Iraqis don't know how to spell, how to do kibbiniya, you know. What, what are you talking about? This is horrible. This is horrible. You're not, you know, not going to be happy. You have to marry a Lebanese. This is not Islamic, completely non-Islamic. So make sure that you, you really treat the subject from a completely, purely Islamic perspective. How much time do I have, sister? Okay, so I was one minute ahead of my time, right? Okay, all right. Okay, so now let's say that somebody got divorced. Somebody couldn't get married for whatever reason. Uh, somebody is in a situation where they cannot get married for any circumstances, I don't want to get into you know all the different uh, possibilities. Do they have any other alternatives, Islamically or culturally? Culturally, they do not have many alternatives. What our cultures want to do with them is to make them die deprived 
of something that Allah built into them, which is intimacy. This is what our cultures do, even Shia cultures. Really, this is the fact, this is Shia cultures. How many of you honestly, I'm not saying understand, but how many of you honestly endorse and accept muta? Honestly. Of course, none of the sisters, well, thank you, sister, you have some courage at least, right? Okay? None of the sisters would say that. Because married sisters don't accept it because they don't want their husbands to have muta, right? And brothers don't want to say it because their sisters, the wives are here, right? Okay? Okay? So, how many of you understand muta? Honestly. Okay, good. We don't have a lot of people who understand muta. I'll explain what muta is. Muta is a marriage, a contract between uh, a man and a woman uh, with a lot of conditions. She cannot be married. She cannot be an udda from a previous marriage, you know, that waiting period. Uh, she has to have control of her own affairs. That means, you know, she's an adult, either working or controls her life. And um, they have to agree on a term, a period of time, and they have to agree on a dowry. Okay? Fair enough? And there's a very specific format for it. Very simple, right? Now, muta, true or false, muta was only sanctioned by Shia Muslims. How many of you say it? Okay, who was it sanctioned by? Sanctioned means agreed on. Hamar didn't like it, right? Okay. Is that a true statement? Who said it's not a true statement? What? Okay, correct us, Sayyid Adnan. Man, you're stealing my offender, you know, that you can't do that, okay? Muta, muta was practiced by Jews. There are two types of rabbis. There is the uh, Torahic rabbis who follow the Torah, and there is Talmudic rabbis who follow the Talmud. Talmudic rabbis are somewhat mujtahids, they're called, they call, okay? They're mujtahids of Jews. So the Talmudic rabbis sanctioned muta. They actually used to, when they travel, they would advertise before they get there, hey, I'm going to be there for three days or a month or two months, and I'm looking for muta. In Hebrew, they call it Kedisha. R uh, Torahic rabbis said, no, 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 we don't want this. Why? Their objection to it, you know what it was? Because they didn't want the Talmudic rabbis, seriously. You read, just go search Google. They didn't want the Talmudic rabbis to have first dips in women. It has nothing to do with the morality or anything like that. Later on, they started writing about this. Now, I have a theory that I wrote about, which is Umar, Umar his counsel was Ka'b al-Ahbar, the head rabbi. It's known by even the Sunnis, Sunni brothers would accept this. Umar made muta haram not because of any other reason except that Ka'b al-Ahbar told him it's illegal because he was a Torahic rabbi. In the Bible, how many of you know the Bible well? You know the Bible well? Anybody else you know the Bible? Do you know, uh, do you, did you ever look at all the versions of the, the rabbi sister? Older copies of the, the Bible? Have I looked at all the copies? Yeah, o older, older copies of the Bible. No. No problem, okay. How about you, brother? Okay. If you look for some of the Bibles that were printed even in the 60s, pre-Vatican II, right about Vatican II, you'll find in one of the letters, I think it was to the Philippines, by Paul to the Philippines, he says, for those of you, he says, I prefer that you don't get married to his disciples. But for those of you who are burning with passion, it's okay to take a wife for a while, for a time or for a while. That's muta, right? So Islam and Shia Muslims didn't invent something that Allah didn't endorse. It has been around for a long time in all other religions. Now look at us. Sunnis are fighting us every day about muta. It's haram, it's zina, it's bid'ah, it is whatever it is they say, right? Isn't that what they say to us? And we say, no, you guys, you, you, you're wrong. You're saying this because Omar said it's bad. Allah said it's halal, right? Isn't that the truth? Okay. But when it comes to practic practically, how many of you put your hands up that muta was okay? One brother. And mashallah, he keeps putting his hand up. And one sister. And one sister, I'm sorry, yes. And one sister, yes, yes. Sorry, sister. I agree with you. So one brother and one sister. While we say, all of you guys agree, 
that Umar is the one who made it haram. Why are you making something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made halal haram? You think Allah doesn't know. You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know what the wisdom of the muta is? Of course he does. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows us better than ourselves. And forgive me brothers and sisters, I'm going to say something a little colorful here. But we have regressed a great deal when it comes to sexuality. We have uh, brought in so many shackles that were created by our cultures about sexuality. All you have to do is look back at the times of all prophets and imams and women who came to each other and they dealt with sexuality as like food. Some of it is halal, some of it is haram. In our minds, we became like Catholics. When we talk about sexuality and intimacy, it's always associated with guilt. There are guidelines for it. Let's just learn the guidelines. It's haram for us to deprive the brothers and sisters who for some reason or another cannot get married of the right to have a temporary marriage. It's haram. Don't get in people's faces and say, well, I don't agree with it. You know why Sunnis, Sunnis, some Sunni ulama, they said Muawiyah was a kafir. Do you know why? Not because he fought Imam Ali alayhi salam. That's okay with them. But because Muawiyah, and I'll wrap up, we'll take questions here. Muawiyah was drinking with a silver cup one of the companions said, the Prophet said, this is haram. Muawiyah said, well, but I have another opinion. He said, see, he's kafir. But they're right. You cannot. If Allah said something is halal, don't say it's haram. Say, be honest with yourselves. If we are honest with ourselves, a lot of problems go away. Say, I don't want my husband, I don't want my son, I don't want my brother to have muta. I just don't. I'm jealous. Accept that. I'm talking to the sisters. For the brothers, don't say, it's it's haram, while it's not haram. Don't say it is haram. Don't make it haram for yourself if it's not haram. You don't want your son to have it, just say it's halal, but I don't want you to have it. But you will not postpone a possible marriage by having that like more practical. Yeah, and I'm, I'm talking about situations, brother, where you know, a, a marriage, a permanent marriage is not possible. Okay, that's what I'm talking yes. about. Okay? So, uh, you know, we have a lot of subjects to talk about. I highly encourage brothers and sisters, no matter what, I know we have uh, you know, a wider subject to talk about, but you didn't give me enough time, right? Uh, I encourage brothers and sisters to always try to get married early, encourage their kids to get married early, make it easy for them, uh, you know, encourage them to marry uh, uh, you know, people who are, if, you, if possible, from the same communities that we have in the United States. I'm okay with people marrying people from other countries as well. I am 100% okay with it. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% okay with that, you know. But I just want, to, want you to understand uh, where I'm coming from with all of this. And then if, uh, try not to get divorced, try every way that you can to preserve your marriages. But if you must come to divorce, don't let it be the end of the world for you. Understand your Islamic options and don't worry about the community because the community will shackle you in many ways. The community will not let you think freely. Don't listen to the community when it comes to that. Um, and inshallah, I'll stop here. I know I have, I'd like to talk a little more, but I want to be respectful of time. I'll stop here, inshallah, and see if you guys have any questions, inshallah. Salawat.
contracts need value in them. So you can say, oh, you know, look, I'll give you a thousand bucks if you agree to this and it becomes a subsequent agreement. It has nothing to do with a marriage contract. It's an agreement between two people. And Islam says, it's an agreement that you have to respect. The sister will, take the, will feel the questions. Okay. So let me just ask, ask this one first. What is the hukum of a married man doing muta'a without the permission of his wife? No. What is the ruling of a married man doing muta'a without the permission of his wife? It depends on who he follows. But most of our scholars say that you cannot have muta'a without the permission of your wife. You can't. So brothers, you need to understand this. Not in the presence. And, and when he has a wife. <laughs> 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 that would be really interesting, actually. No. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, yes. If somebody has, if a man has a wife, can he go have muta without her permission? Did I say in the presence of his wife? Yeah. Sorry, uh, uh, that's my fault. But it only takes a bright man to catch that one, you know? <laughs> Yes, the brother says, Are you, were you encouraging sisters to l levy these conditions in their husbands? No, I'm just making them aware. Because from my experience, again, with really many marriages and marriages that had problems, if they knew, if they resolved that ahead of time, it wouldn't be an issue. And Allah, it's true, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the default to be these, but also it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who said, according to our scholars, that, you, that a woman can negotiate these issues. So it's wisdom on both sides. Okay, so what's the best way to find a wife? I know what's, this is like... Oh, okay, that's I, a brother, I think, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's important to find a Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The best, the best way to, honestly, the best way to find a wife is to ask in your community, come to conferences like this, honestly. I mean, look, you know, I'm a father to all of you, except the ones who are older than me. I'm your brother then, right? But seriously, in the conference, it's okay Islamically to say, you know, I saw a sister that, I, you know, that, that, you know, and I heard her talk or whatever that appeals to me. Go talk to your parents. Go talk to your sheikh. Talk to your imam. Talk to your friend. Talk to your sister. Say, can you find out more? And then they can introduce you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put a great mechanism for, in place for you to get to know each other. We all, we all need to respect this, and most parents do respect this, as far as I know. Most parents, all parents actually, would love to see their children happy. All parents. So it's okay to do this. Same thing for sisters, by the way. You know, it's okay to say, you know, uh, you know I heard this brother, uh, you know, I heard him speak, or I saw him write, or you know, I heard something about him that really appeals to me. I'd like to find out more. You have the same mechanisms to the same thing. It's to find out more. and. You know, it's, it's, this is what Allah sanctioned for us. This is what Allah made halal for us. And a piece of advice for parents. A piece of advice for parents. Don't get too involved in this process. Seriously, don't get overpowering, overshadowing, helicoptering, they call it. That, well, are you sure, you know, you know I saw that girl and, and the dress that she's wearing, that's not the kind of dress that I'd wear. Why? Because the color is yellow, and I don't like yellow. <laughs> It's not, that's not important. That's not important at all. Yes, if you know something about that woman or that girl that she is, you know, that, that you, sh you need to let your son know about, absolutely, that's your obligation. It's an obligation of everybody. Okay, we have a lot of questions along the same line and comments. Um, it basically says that one of the biggest problems with mata is that people do it and abuse it when they do it and they don't understand the guidelines and they focus the issue on what are the, the conditions um, to perform mata, especially when the girl is a virgin um, and the father's permission aspect of it if you could clarify that yes I'll go over the rules of mata one more time I'll talk about it mata is not for everybody you know, I'll tell you, I have a lecture about muta'a, very convincing in Arabic. I believe that muta'a has a lot of places. As a professor, I gave a lecture about the history and politics of Iran one time at the university. And the, the, the lecture hall was 
probably had 400, 500 people, professors and students. Half of the Saudi students came because they don't like Iran. It's true. And a lot of, a lot of Shia students from Saudi Arabia and other places come because they like Iran. We're Shias, we know each other, right? Okay. The Saudis came to me after I was done with my lecture. They all yelled at me. Iran, how dare you talk good about it? Anyway, that's besides the point. We're done. I start walking out of the hall. They have a band that starts playing. I walked about probably 200 meters. By the time I get to the door, people stop me, talk to me. The Saudi students, Sunni students, I'm going to be honest with you, were all dancing with their girlfriends. By the way, they just came from Salat al Jum'ah, right? And the Shia students were very respectful and they came with their muda wives. They tell me, they know me. Shaykh, did I do it right? Can I do it right? Can you tell me? And I tell them, absolutely. They're not doing haram. The Sunni students are doing something haram. Let's be honest with ourselves. We preserve our, ourselves with this stuff. So, muda has rules. Man, you're married, you want to have muta, you need your wife's permission. If she says no, you cannot have muta. Simple. Done? Anybody done? So Brother Saeed, change your mind, right? <laughs> uh, Brother Saeed is better than that, I don't. Okay? So, that's one thing. Sisters, you have to be unmarried. Oh, you have to be a divorcee. Um, and if you're a virgin, you have to ask your father's permission. There is an exception to this, but I'm not going to mention the exception. That, well, it's, it will open up a lot of other discussion. I know I don't have a lot of time, okay? Um, uh, well, one of the exceptions is if the father gives permission, right? Okay. Um, if you have been married before, divorced, if you are on your own, single, you do not need your father's permission. But learn the rules. Learn, let me finish this story. Learn the rules, okay? The person in front of you has to believe in muta'ah. That is very important. It has to understand and believe in muta'ah. Believe it's halal. Because I've had some Shia sisters who come to me and say, I want to have muta'ah with this Sunni boy. I said, does he believe in it? And he says, no, but he'll accept it. No, he doesn't accept it. He doesn't accept it. I will tell you, this is really harsh, but forgive me. I know some Sunnis who score having muta'ah with Shia girls. Score. I had this many with muta'ahs with Shia girls. Don't. Well, let me just, uh, yeah, I, I, because the sister had her hand up, but I want to respect that first before you. So, it is haram to have muta'ah with another Muslim, even if they're Shia, if they do not accept muta'ah. They have to accept it. Accept it as a true teaching and a legal issue in Islam. They have to understand the format of muta'ah. That they both, well, you know, the woman has to understand that she cannot have a muta'ah with two guys at the same time. I'm going to be honest with you, okay? That's haram, that's zina. That after the period is over, muta'ah is over, that she has uddah, she has three months. She cannot be with another man. If she wants to renew the muta'ah with the same person, they can do that. They extend it. If it's after the time uh, had expired, they have to start the new muta'ah. In other words, she can ask him for a new dowry. Brothers and sisters, especially for the younger ones who are engaged and they do, they do the muta'ah so they can get to know each other, you can have a muta'ah with the provision that you, cannot have, you will not have intimacy, which is a good thing to have because you get to know the person, That's right. okay? In marriage, in permanent marriage, you cannot have a marriage that's a platonic marriage, a marriage without sex. That's not a marriage in Islam. The right for sex for both of them. Let's just be honest about this, straightforward. Uh, if they have a child, the father is responsible for the child. The child is a legitimate child in Islam. Now, I want to ask you a quiz. Who was one of the Sahaba who was a child of Muta? Ab who? <laughs> who said Abu Bakr? Put your hand up. Masha Allah, you're too hard on Abu Bakr, brother. You know? <laughs> what did you say, Abu Bakr? <laughs> Abdullah ibn Zubair. Abdullah ibn Zubair, his father, Zubair ibn Al-Awwam, had Muta with Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, and they had a child whose name was Abdullah ibn Zubair. Okay, did I answer that question about Muta? Is it clear? Yeah. Okay. This is, um, uh, this is gonna be the last question because we are, it's time, but I will end it with one more question. 
Um, and this was, why always compare marriage relationship to work? Do, do you not think it is different situation? I don't. Uh, not facing coworker all day. It's not over, is not oversimplifying the issue a problem? We need a specific, sol specific solution. Yeah, good question actually. Why do I always compare marriage to work? I didn't actually. I didn't. What I did is I compared our interaction with coworkers with our interaction with our spouses. And specifically for this, especially for us Americans, American people are the hardest working people on the face of the earth. We put in more hours than anybody else. It's true. Statistically, it's true. Okay? But let's look at this. You go, you get to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. You work until 5 p.m. Very closely with your coworkers so you can get a project done. I don't care what your career is, what your profession is, right? Okay? So how many hours is that? And then you have lunch hour, you go to lunch with them lots of times, right? Or bring lunch in or eat sandwiches in the lunch room, right? You go home, you get home at what time? Six o'clock, right? You eat dinner, you're eating now, you don't have time to talk, right? You're eating. How long, how long does that take you? Guys, 10 minutes. Women, half an hour, right? <laughs> Isn't that what it is? Women all, my wife always complains about you eat too fast, sit down, talk, you know, right? Uh, so let's say that it's half an hour at most. Or when you get home, your wife is cooking, preparing a meal. Most traditional homes are like that, right? Most of them. So now, what, ti what time do you really get to sit down and talk to your family? And then comes, how many of you sleep at 10 o'clock if you work 8 to 5? How many sleep at 11 o'clock before 11? Most of us. How many times did you spend with your family? You actually spend more time with your coworkers. So comparing coworkers' relationships with coworkers with a relationship with our uh, spouses and family members is very legitimate. I'm not saying it's the same relationship, but it is legitimate because it's, it, has, it has more of the similar dynamics. It's true you don't have the same love, you don't have the same compassion towards the person, but you have respect for your coworkers. I hope you do, you're a Muslim, right? You have, you know, you honor your coworkers. But it's a different relationship, yet the interaction is a very legitimate example to use in this case.